Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And thank you for joining us to discuss a new path to education reform, the next chapter on 21st century skills. I'm Helen Hadani, and I'm a fellow at the Brookings Institution with the Center for Universal Education and the Bass Center for Transformative Placemaking. And I'm honored and excited to be joined today by my colleague, Emiliana Vegas, who will moderate our panel discussion today. And I also have the honor of introducing our distinguished panel of speakers, Ted Dintersmith, Professor Kathy Hirsch-Pasek, Elizabeth Edersheim, and Victoria Sullivan. Before formally introducing our speakers, I wanted to take a few minutes to give you some background on our discussion and a brief overview of a recent Brookings report titled A New Path to Education Reform, Playful Learning Promotes 21st Century Skills in Schools and Beyond. The report was co-authored by Kathy Hirsch-Pasek, Elias Blinkoff, Roberta Golenkoff, and myself. And I wanna just take a moment to thank and call out our collaborators, Elias and Roberta, who are joining us virtually today. As we start a new year with hope and optimism, we also reflect on how the current pandemic has reshaped our lives. And one of the most marked sources of stress for parents has been remote schooling. Many of us on the webinar today, including myself, know the many challenges of remote schooling. And unfortunately, distance learning is not working for many children and families, especially those living in low income and under-resourced neighborhoods and communities. And what parents and educators are realizing now being almost a year into distant learning is that problems with remote schooling are exacerbations of regular in-person instruction. So that is, education was not working very well even before COVID-19. But with crisis comes opportunity and a moment to rethink and transform our education system to prepare all students to thrive. These moments that challenge our society as a whole are also times when we have the greatest opportunity to think about what we are doing and not be satisfied with the status quo. So here's a quick thought experiment. Think back to what your classroom looked like in the third grade. That's many more years ago than some of us care to remember. If you walked into a third classroom, third grade classroom today, chances are it would not look that much different. You still have the same rows of seats with students seated, looking towards the front, hopefully listening to their teacher lecturing. So it's remarkable how little schools have changed over the past several decades. Yet think about almost any other area or field, technology, business, medicine. Our laptop computers look nothing like they did even five or 10 years ago. Yet American classrooms have been stuck with a factory model of education, which has a very narrow focus on content outcomes rather than preparing students to have the ability to work with others, to critically think through problems and to systematically apply new knowledge. COVID-19 has highlighted the power of science. The pandemic will certainly challenge and change how we think about and what is possible in vaccine development. But we can also look to science for answers in what works for education. In our recent Brookings report, we present a model for transformational education reform based on the evidence from the science of learning around how children learn and what children learn. When examining how children learn, we promote a set of learning principles that children learn best when education is active with room for discovery and experiential learning, when it is engaging without distraction, when it is made meaningful through connections between new information and prior knowledge. 
and when it is socially interactive with both peer collaboration and adult support. And when it is iterative with chances to form, test and revise hypotheses about how the world works. And last but definitely not least, and maybe most important in today's world is when learning is joyful. So these principles emerge in a type of play that we call guided play, in which an adult facilitates child-led playful activities to meet a specific learning goal. It could be learning about numbers, shapes, colors, spatial relations. To address what children learn, we offer a breadth of skills approach, the six C's. Communication, collaboration, content, critical thinking, creative innovation, and confidence. These six C's build on each other systematically and can be found not only in the classroom, but also in informal learning spaces in the public realm. Playful Learning Landscapes is an initiative that uniquely blends the science of learning, placemaking, and community cohesion, transforming public and shared spaces into fun and enriching learning environments for the development of healthy families, children, and communities. It's now my pleasure to introduce our distinguished panel of experts that brings expertise and a wealth of wisdom on education innovation, developmental and learning science, business and leadership, and education policy. It's first my pleasure to introduce Ted Dintersmith, who is an author, filmmaker, and philanthropist at the intersection of education, career and citizenship skills, and democracy. Ted's recent book, What School Could Be, Insights and Inspiration from Teachers Across America documents his travels to all 50 states, 200 schools, and his discussions with students, parents, teachers, and educators, highlighting the very best of US education, how innovative teachers are preparing children to thrive through engaged and authentic learning. In 2012, Ted was appointed by President Obama to represent the United States at the UN General Assembly. And in 2018, he won, he received the prestigious NEA Friend of Education Award. It's now my honor to introduce my colleague, Kathy Hirsch-Pasek, who is the Stanley and Deborah Lefkowitz Faculty Fellow at Temple University and also a Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution. Kathy is an internationally known developmental scholar whose research examines the development of early language and literacy, STEM, and the role of play and learning. With her long-term collaborator, Roberta Golenkoff, she is the author of hundreds of publications and 14 books, including Becoming Brilliant, What Science Tells Us About Raising Successful Children in which she and Roberta introduce us to the six C's. Kathy is the winner of many Lifetime Achievement and Distinguished Contribution Awards from organizations including the American Education Research Association, the American Psychological Association, and the Society for Research in Child Development. It's next my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Edersheim, who has studied, written about, and advised organizations in a multitude of both private and public sectors for over 35 years. Elizabeth was one of the first female partners at McKinsey and Company, and she later founded New York Consulting Partners. Elizabeth now apply her, applies her skills and, and expertise to advising leadership while also teaching at NYU's Preston Robert Tisch Institute for Global Sport and the Jonathan M. Tisch Center of Hospitality. She is the author of McKinsey's Mar Marvin Bauer and The Definitive Drucker. And she and Kathy have had conversations about the development of the six C's with respect to characteristics that govern how children learn and those that are relevant in the boardroom and how those overlap and intersect. 
And it's now my pleasure to introduce Representative Victoria Sullivan, former New Hampshire State Representative, who will share her experience as a congressional leader in education policy to promote playful learning in schools. Victoria's time in a classroom as a parent volunteer and running a theater program in her children's elementary school opened her eyes to the significant changes in education where play was being replaced by a more rigorous kindergarten experience. And this led Victoria to run for the New Hampshire State Legislature, where she served on the House Education Committee for four years. As a legislator, Victoria crafted and sponsored the play-based kindergarten bill, which became state law in 2018. Victoria currently works for the University of New Hampshire and the New Hampshire Department of Education through the Preschool Development Grant, which was awarded to the state in 2019. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Emiliana Vegas, Senior Fellow and Co-Director of the Center for Universal Education at Brookings. Emiliana is a leading expert on education in developing countries and has written extensively on issues affecting education systems in Latin America, the Caribbean, and other developing regions. On topics ranging from policies to race teacher effectiveness to school finance and early childhood development and policies. Before joining Brookings, Emiliana served as the chief of the education division at the Inter-American Development Bank, the IDB, where she led a team working in the bank's leading um, lending operations and analytical activities to support education systems throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. We're honored and excited to have her moderate today's discussion. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Emiliana. Thank you, Helen. I am delighted to moderate this discussion on creating a new path for education reform with playful learning and 21st century skills at the forefront. One of the goals of our discussion today is to shift the conversation from what is not working in education to seizing the opportunity that in this unprecedented time offers for educators, scientists, and policymakers to rethink how we can create a system that is designed for the 21st and not for the 20th century. Please send us your questions you have via Twitter by using the hashtag, hashtag 21 CS reform, or by emailing your question to events at brookings.edu. If we don't have time to answer your question today, Roberta Golenkoff and Elias Linkoff will be answering some of your questions in a post-event blog that will be published on the Brookings website. I'm so excited to moderate this panel of remarkable individuals, and I promise we will have a very lively discussion. So let's start with Kathy. The framing of our discussion today comes from a recent Brookings report that you co-authored with Elias Linkoff, Roberta Golenkoff, and Helen Hadani on a policy proposal for playful learning in schools and beyond to prepare students for work and life. What is the problem with our education system and why did you write this particular piece? Good question, Emiliana, we'll get it launched. Well, we've known for years that the education system has some problems and this is globally. In fact, in the United States, a piece came out in 1975 called A Nation at Risk. And when you look at the outcome scores since that piece came out in 1975, nothing much has changed. It's nudged, but we're not really moving the needle. And many people around the world, including Pussy Salberg from um, originally from Finland and now Australia, says that it's really that we're too test driven and too narrowly focused on what we're trying to teach kids. So in this factory model, it's as if the kids are the widgets and they're coming out widgetized but it turns out that what the factory is creating is not what business leaders need when they're hiring. So business people are telling us they really can't hire our graduates. And it forces us as Ed21 has done to rethink what do we want? What do we want from our graduates? What should a graduate of an education system look like? I would also argue that our teachers have been handcuffed by this system that's narrowly focused um, not to say that literacy and math isn't important, but to say that if that's all you do, 
you miss the breadth of skills. So we decided that we wanted to present something that was an educational system that could respect teachers, that is more inclusive, is culturally flexible, and can be used to help every child thrive and get 21st century skills. That's great. Um, Kathy, thank you. Ted, your book, What Schools Could Be, showcases how some teachers and schools are engaging and inspiring their students with innovative practices and challenging the status quo. What surprised you most about what you observed in classrooms and from talking to students and educators? Well, you know, I felt like I owed it to the education community. I have a business background and I always start by apologizing for having a business background because I'm fully aware of how much of a mess most business people make when they get involved with education. And so I thought it was incumbent on me to actually get out in the field and, and listen to and learn from our educators doing the very hard work. So I sort of threw myself into it and I was blown away. I mean, if I had to say insight number one, it's the dedication, the expertise of our teaching force, but also... The fact is, you know, that if we want to prepare kids for a world going forward that just has no resemblance to the last century, this isn't nuclear fusion. This isn't an invention we just can't quite make. You know, we've got teachers all over the country doing these great things, but they're sort of in pockets instead of widely embraced. And I, and I think the teachers know what to do. They want to do it. The students know how they learn best. They want to be in those environments. I think it's really incumbent on the policies we put in place, the priorities we put in place that often impede the best work of our students. And so it, it to me is not a, a minor issue. That's why I'm so glad you're convening this forum. It's code red. And I've been on this for some time. And when I started, I said, you know, like if we don't get school priorities right on a fairly urgent basis, I'm not convinced our democracy will survive. You know, in 10 years ago, during the Obama years, when, when you never heard about the presidency, people would say, oh, you're, you're way too alarmist. I mean, there's no, that would never happen in the United States. And here we're convening this on a momentous day. And I think today, raising the question that democracy is challenged largely because of failed priorities and policies in education doesn't seem like such a far-fetched perspective. I'm gonna hold on to that thought and we'll come back to you in a second, but I wanted to move to Elizabeth and um, mention that, you know, the Brookings report describes what they call, what Kathy and, and others have called the six C's, collaboration, communication, content, critical thinking, creative innovation, and confidence as a breadth of skills approach to education. Given your expertise in advising leadership and years of experience in the business world, what do you see as critical skills that students need for success in the 21st century workforce? And are, do you see that young people are entering the workforce with those skills? Thank you. I want to start with something Ted said about democracy. When I was working with Peter Drucker, he said what let Hitler rise to power was that the economy had collapsed and people were desperately seeking something they knew it wasn't real, but they were reaching for straws, and it could happen any place. Um, the economy has to work. We have to respect ourselves. What does it take for that to happen? We need to recognize that there's technological, demographic, and global transformations that require a different way of, of working. And, and when you think about an individual, and then I'll come back to the corporation for a moment. Uh, if you, an individual has a 45 year career path on average, corporations last 15 years. They have to last more than the corporation. Today, about 56% of the people who go to work are disengaged. That means they're there so they don't get fired and they can take their paycheck home. That isn't going to help the economy work. That's not going to help democracy thrive. What does it take? It takes engagement, meaningful, interactive, iterative approach, and a joyful place. What does that mean? It means that individuals need to come with the six C's to work and organizations need to invest in the six C's. Um, I can give you examples from each of them, but let me just take a couple for a moment. Um, creative innovations. Organi 
who's taught in business school to experiment, to learn from your mistakes? Does it matter? It absolutely matters. When you think about 3M or the, or, and the post-it notes, those all happen because people innovate. One of the companies I work with is really working around six C's and that's the ultimate guitar. What they did was they created something called your pitch coach for every employee. So you have your boss who runs system, but you also have your pitch coach. And on every Tuesday, they have a pitch meeting. And every employee has to pitch an idea once every six weeks. And in those pitch meetings, they pick ideas to invest in. So you have to innovate, you have to push, you have to think about how to communicate those ideas. Um, a second, if you think about collaboration, um, this is one of my absolute favorite stories is Paul Pullman at Unilever wanted to do something on sustainability, but Unilever wasn't big enough. So he got 30 plus organizations in Switzerland, all of whom touched coffee from growing it to serving it in the cafe to collectively come together. And they saved 75% of the water that it takes to produce a cup of coffee. Something none of them could have done alone, but required collaboration. I can go on about each of these six C's with examples out the wazoo, but it really is about the organizations investing in them and the people stepping into them so they can be happy in their jobs, engaged, et cetera. And thank you for that. And, and moving for a sec back to kind of how you build those skills in schools, Kathy, in your report, you've talked a lot and, and in your work about um, play and learning through play. How is that different from, um, you know, just play, free play versus guided play? How, how is play important to develop these six C's that you talk about? Well, for us, um, play and us being Roberta and me and, and many, many of our wonderful students, uh, play is kind of a, a metaphor for a kind of progressive education that is active, engaged, meaningful, socially interactive, which we take very seriously, going back to Liz's, Liz's point of collaboration. In fact, I don't know a business that doesn't work on teams anymore or with teams anymore. Um, iterative, such that as you look at a problem, you see it in many different ways. And that means you can generalize what you've learned to another example later on and create something new and joyful. You've got to have the persistence to want to stay there. It turns out that these skills of playful, what we call playful learning, they don't happen when you just go romping in the backyard. You're not going to learn to read that way. You have to have a learning goal. So there's structure to all of this, but it's kind of constrained structure, if you will, constrained tinkering that allows you to move in an iterative way toward a learning goal through play. And what are the goals? The profile of the six C's. How do we learn to get along collaboratively? How do we learn to communicate those goals? The very things that everyone else is talking about. And let me add just one more point to it, which is that Robert and I have worked really hard not to just come up with a, a random set of playful skills or activities and a random set of six C's. These are actually all based in the science of learning. And the system of the six C's is itself systemic in that it builds on one another. You can't have communication without having someone to talk to, collaboration. You can't build content if you can't communicate about it. So you can see the rise in a kind of cyclical way that allows people to grow. And the last point I'll make is that We've now tried this system in schools where teachers were very hesitant, oh my gosh, is it gonna work? And the next year coming up and hugging us, this was of course before COVID when you can't hug anymore, but, um, but they hugged us and said, thank you, thank you. We weren't sure about this. We thought it was a fundamental change to what we do. No, it's taking the handcuffs off. It's respecting them on themes that they care about and then allowing them to teach the topics they teach. They still get content, but to also grow the other skills that are so important around it. 
So, uh, Victor, I'm going to turn to you. Both both Ted and, and Kathy have alluded to the fact that teachers and students want this kind of learning environment and experience, and that policies and, and sort of the decisions that policymakers are made are constraining them. Um, what was your experience? You know, what sparked your work in the New Hampshire legislature to develop the play-based kindergarten bill? And how do you expect that it will change how teachers are trained and what classrooms look like in kindergartens across the state? I first want to say thank you for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. Um, I will tell you, my children are two years apart. They're teenagers now. So this was way back. They were kindergartners. And in the two year difference between my older child and my younger child, the difference that I saw as a classroom parent um, in education was dramatic. They had the same teacher, same school same kindergarten classroom and it had changed dramatically from um, in my, my older son's class, they did a play during the year and there was a lot of guided reading and they got outside almost every day. And then my younger child, they didn't have time for the play. There was more, you know, sitting time and there was, it was a privilege if they got to go outside. And I, the, the teacher became a good friend of mine and her frustration being a long time kindergarten teacher in what was happening um, was coming through. And she, it was difficult for the kindergarten teachers to sort of take on this new role. And these new, we kept hearing about rigorous standards when I was in the education committee, rigorous standards for kindergarten. And I thought, my God, why are we talking about rigor and kindergarten in the same sentence? Does any, anybody else see red flags here? Or is, it, is it just me? Um, so I started to do a lot of research on it and realized that this wasn't a problem in my child's school or even in our community. This was happening everywhere. And you know, there were articles about, is kindergarten the new first grade? And then there were all kinds of articles about how disruptive kindergarten had become because children can't be expected to sit for long periods of time at that age. And I will tell you the first year that I put in the bill, it was not received well. That's really an understatement. Um, I, <laughs> it was not received well at all. Um, and that was sometimes by former teachers who were in the legislature who didn't understand the change that had happened. They thought that, you know, I didn't know what I was talking about. Of course, kindergarten is play, you know, because they, they weren't in the classroom to see the, the drastic changes. But it was through the conversations that we continued to have after the bill failed. Um, they got people to be more aware and gave teachers, I think, the empowerment to start speaking up saying, hey, you know, this is actually happening and we really need some help here. So I did engage teachers and administrators when I wrote the bill. And the second time around, it passed our committee unanimously. It passed the House, I think it was 357 to 8. It struggled a little bit more in the Senate, which happens, but we we got it through. So anybody that's trying to work on this, I just want to say, keep at it. But we did have a little bit of pushback from teachers too, who were tired of the legislature telling them how to run a classroom. They'd been so restricted in what they could do. And they had really lost a lot of control that when I was, you know, when this did become law and I, I did speak to teachers and said, no, the intent is to give your classroom back to you. The whole intent is to give you back through creativity that, you know, you want to bring to your teaching. And I think that now with UNH has embraced the preschool development grant and it has been a great partner to get coaching into the classrooms and each kindergarten teacher that we coach becomes an advocate for play and they start to, you know, tell teach other teachers about how this is done. And we really had to rely on in some cases older teachers because new teachers aren't learning this way. So these these conversations are so important, having people in the field like Kathy out there talking because she came and she spoke in New Hampshire for us once um, and addressed the teachers and letting them know that they have the support in this is, is really important. So let me ask a, a difficult question that also came from one of our audience members that, um, and, and the question is, you know, is this feasible in low income settings where you have fewer resources? And maybe I'll turn to Chet because I know you've been working on this. Yeah, you know, so this is a topic near and dear to my heart. And as a result of having traveled all over America um, and also spending all my time, I don't charge for anything I do. And so I, I go where the kids are, not where the fees are, which I think is really important. So I spent a lot of time in rural and in inner city and in native communities. Here's an important point, right? Is that to a very large extent, when school is boring and irrelevant, then 
The kids' performance is largely a result of the push and the resources of the parents. When school is interesting, when school taps into the intrinsic motivation of the kids, the parent push becomes a lot less relevant. And so in my book, I write about the fact that isn't it amazing that kids growing up in the most challenging circumstances, when our education strategy is bury them in worksheets, they, they don't do well. You know, the, the, but when you see these schools, you see these courageous teachers who often, by the way, have to fight against the current to make this happen, that engage these kids to take on bold initiatives, the, these kids actually blow us away. And, and so I always ask the question, which is better preparation for life? You know, memorizing how to factor polynomials or what the definition of a gerund is or a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, we could go through an entire litany, particularly of middle and high school. And when I'd say the topic, every single person listening would immediately think school because they never use it any other time, right? So when that's the essence of school, a bunch of stuff that's in there because it's convenient for the people who design and administer and make money off of these tests, you're largely testing and reflecting the push and the resources of the parents. When you let kids invent and create, invite them to fail, be bold and think outside of the box, honestly, a lot of the kids in the rich communities are allergic to that. They just want to know, what do I have to do to get an A? And a lot of times the kids we think are in lim have limited proficiency, they actually like, you're stunned. I'm like, gosh, and people will say, and I think it's offensive, but they'll say, I had no idea they had it in them. Well, all these kids have it in them. We just need to let it out. And we need to trust our teachers to let it out. Because when I step back and say, what's better preparation for life? You know, inventing and creating and carrying out bold initiatives or uh, knowing the difference between opposite and nibid? You know, like, well, which is better preparation for life? And people will invariably say, oh, well, of course. You know, I did this film. I started with this film, Most Likely to Succeed, where you work backwards from the citizenship and career requirements of the modern world and then show education environments where kids are working collaboratively on big stretch cross-discipline projects with teachers trusted to teach to their expertise and passions. When people see it, when they get that vision in their mind, and we've done 10,000 community screenings in you know, 35 different countries, so a lot of people have seen it. They just say, man, that's what we want, right? That's what we want. And, and yet we so seldom let that happen. And, and so I think we just need to start trusting our educators to run with things. And I think we'll get later today, a key is rethinking assessments. You know, Victoria, I spent a lot of time in New Hampshire and when they switched to competency-based and performance-based, that was a big step forward. So, so I think if I had to emphasize anything, I'd, I'd say we need to be educating with a look forward instead of just continuing to tinker around the edges of the school we all inherited. And, and the last thing I'll say is, so I'm probably, I'm certainly the oldest person on this panel and maybe out of the thousand plus people signed up for this, I'm probably the oldest person there. People will say school hasn't changed in 50 years, 60 years. Here's how it's changed. First, when I was in school, we all took hands-on courses. We had to take shop. We, our innovation is let's get rid of anything hands-on and just do college ready. Oh, that's a great idea. But the second thing is when I was in school, school was like half of my life. I had another half of my life to do whatever the heck I wanted to do. When you talk to kids in school today, school is 125% of them. They're not getting enough sleep. So we've taken all that time for kids to play and explore. And, and I will put in, I'm, I have no tie to Brookings. I have no connection at all. The report that Kathy and Helen did is extraordinary. And everybody should not only read this, but get this in the hands of your governor, your state legislators, your school boards, because it, in a really powerful way, makes the point about what we need to be prioritizing going forward. Thank you for that. And, and you alluded, um, Ted, to the issue of how do you evaluate or, or how do we change these evaluations? And actually, we got a question from one of our Twitter audience members, uh, Joe Hoggarty, who uh, asked, are there any evaluations available of the work you, Kathy, and your colleagues have done with teachers on the six P? Um, yes, there, there is a little. I just wanted to introduce everyone um, to a school, and I think this will, this will answer both of your questions, the last two questions, Emiliana. Um, this is a school in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and it is uh, an under-resourced area where 80% of the students are free lunch and where 80% of the school is Latinx. 
And they have the most incredible principal who had caught on to reading uh, Roberta's in my book, Becoming Brilliant. And she said, I want to create a 6C school. So we ran an experiment there that was cut a little bit, you know, short by COVID. And it's called the Godfrey Lee School, kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. So we decided to look at the outcomes on three different levels. Um, some of the teachers were randomly assigned to go into the 6C classrooms, and some of them were randomly assigned to go in the non-6C classrooms. We wanted to know what would happen. Here are the three levels. We wanted to know first, using something called the tripod measure, which we adapted for this study, could we look at outcomes in collaboration, communication? Could we look at creativity, critical thinking, confidence, which is really our grit or perseverance, um, and content as well? What would happen as far as the teacher evaluation? If we went and asked teachers, what did you think? And what would happen in standard outcome scores? The standard scores that they give in Michigan. So Godfrey, Godfrey Lee, they marched forward with this idea. And what happened? Now, I must tell you that in a year, none of us expected the standard scores to go up. That is none of us. It just wasn't enough time. But what did we find? They inched forward. This was unheard of. And then it turns out that not only did they inch forward, but we didn't have the summer loss in math and in reading. I guess when you have motivated people like Ted is talking about, they learn more and they learn better. Well, what about the six C's? Well, on the report from the kids themselves, they said, yeah, our classrooms changed. We feel like they're more creative. We feel like they're more collaborative now. And what did the teachers say? Thank you. Thank you. We enjoy teaching again. So is this possible? It is. We've come up with, we've come up with training programs that use thematic-based learning. And the only other thing I want to say about it is it works in suburban Philadelphia, non-under-resourced environments just as well. And they're bragging about the 6C approach. And it works in my college classroom as well. I think when we build whole people, they learn not only the 21st century skills, but they also learn to think better. And that translates out into some of those tests that are required. So we have to change the assessments because it has to be about whole people, not just about narrowly construed things. I mean, that's a really nice segue. We, we got a question from our, our friend, John Goodwin, that's you know basically asking what role do high stakes content testing play in sustaining the old factory system and what are the alternatives? You know, So do we have new tests that we can apply readily? Is that a known, um, is there a known way of assessing the 60s? Well, as I said, we've, we've modified the tripod test to do it. Ed21 is another group that's out there that has done a really good job of looking more broadly at what schools want a graduate to look like. Mm -hmm. And then once you figure out what does success look like, then we adapt and we use some of the instruments, and I know Ed21 has some of those instruments as well, to be, be able to look at it. Look, what we don't want to do is define success by what tests we have on our bookshelves. We want to first define success, and then we want to adapt or create new tests that really get at creating a whole person and 21st century skills. Because right now, as Liz told you, the businesses don't even want to hire people. Our nation is still at risk. Hmm. Um, Elizabeth, in your work with you, you mentioned how workplaces should also be developing these skills because obviously the whole burden should be on, on teachers and educators. Um, it's a question to you is have you seen workplaces do this well? And what would be some of the ways in which they do this while it, you know during the uh, yes. So a couple of illustrations here. I mean, first of all, you have to tell a story plus get data. There's some examples we all know. So we, uh, WeWorks can tell a story, but they can't work with data. What happened to them? 
right? Wells Fargo can work with data, but they can't tell a story. What's happening with them? It's, it's Southwest versus United. Southwest can do both. When you feel it as a, as a customer, you see it in their employees. They're investing in their employees telling stories, connecting the dots, collaborating, and they also are worried about the numbers. Uh, there's a there's a Danish company that you know has that crazy Danish thing where they think all people matter, um, and uh, I think it's called Dant Force or something. And they uh, it's a one of the things they did they did before COVID was they randomly assigned people to have lunch together from the CEO to anyone else. So you have lunch, and as an output of your lunch, you have an idea that you submit about how the company can be better. Now they're doing it with matching for coffee on Zooms. Um, and the number of ideas that came from that, how they're being put into play is phenomenal. Um, it's really taking a mindset about caring about creating tomorrow, not learning from the past. Learning from the past, but that's not enough. Learning for tomorrow um, and for the people. Let me turn to Victoria because a lot of a few of the people in the audience have submitted questions around, you know, this is all sounds great, but how do you get this to be scaled? How do you get policymakers, administrators, and teachers on board? And I know you struggled, we mentioned a little bit, but tell us more about what you learned in the process. Um, so we've actually, I've been contacted by legislators um, in different states who want to pick up the, the wording of our bill and and get it into their states. They've been working at it. Of course, COVID interrupted a lot of things, including their work. Um, but I will briefly read you the, um, the language of the bill. It's very easy and it's very small. So I need my cheaters. Standards for kindergarten shall be play-based and have the following components, movement, expression, exploration, socialization, and music. Literacy shall be developed through guided reading and there shall be unstructured time for discovery of each child's individual talents, ability, and needs. And that was as, believe me, they tried, people tried to muddy it up a little bit and make it more complicated, but we fought really hard to keep it simple. And with those standards that gives the teachers so much room in their own in their classroom to make it what they want it to be and so you really have to engage all the stakeholders you need to educate parents like i said the bill didn't go through the first time but it gave us the opportunity to educate people as to why it was important and getting parents on board to understand that it's not just play it's education through play they're actually learning and they're learning better and they're learning in a way that um, actually impacts them for a longer period of time and so once you get parents to be advocates for play, then you know that's then you've got the teachers. You got to get teachers on board too. But most teachers are, and then the teacher, the parents talking to the administrators. The administrators really need to be on board. And when we're talking about you know assessments, we need to change the way we think about those two. It's not always a paper assessment that that we need to have. I would you know my intention is to make this kindergarten bill be actually K through three. I would love to see K through three and have it expand. Um, but we really need to support the teachers on the ground and let you know let them know that for the administrators, a chatty room with movement in it is a positive thing. It doesn't mean that the teacher doesn't have control over the classroom and educating parents that this is really an important way for their children to learn and just get all the stakeholders on the same page. So education, which is again, why this is so important. Education is the biggest component of getting this to be, to, to work across our nation. Um. Thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna to go to Ted, who I know wants to comment on a few things. And then I also got a question from an audience member for you, Ted. So let's start with assessment, Tim. Well, you know, assess I, I always ask for data, you know, like we are awash in data. It takes up a lot of the discretionary dollars in education. And I always ask, why do we not collect data on how much kids actually retain a few months after they take these tests? And we don't, you know, the, it happens in spot places. And when you do that, you find that most of what we think kids are learning is a mirage. And, and you, you look at like the early grades where we tend to get things a lot more right than wrong. You know, when kids get really interested and engaged, they absorb it, they learn it warps. Whenever I wanna get people excited, I just say, visualize some four and five-year-olds, right? 
they're exactly they have the exact perspective and 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 sort of mindset so you need in the modern world they 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 dive into things they go deep they learn joyfully there is a lot of play behind it and yet you'll hear people say oh no 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 we got to get that those layers on before kids can actually do anything and i always say like well, just spend some time with a five-year-old who's fascinated with dinosaurs and ask them about content, right? I mean, they can spell they can spell pterodactyl. You know, it's like they pick up content when they're interested, but we have it all wrong. We say we need the content first and hope, hope that kids survive this process and remain curious and interested and joyful learners. And guess what? They don't. You know, so that I think is when we start to look at data, we need more balance. We need to really understand what's truly learned. I think we should go more toward audited, you know, surveyed types of approaches, you know, let, let you know, do peace on a limited basis just to see some trend lines. We can do that. But I think what happens when you decide it's all about the data, then, you know, I always beg the legislators and, and Victoria has, but many, many haven't. I say, just look at the practice questions on your state mandated exams. And then ask, do you use this as an adult? And the answer is, you don't use it as an adult. And I also say that if we made our, sorry, Victoria, state legislators take the tests that keep kids from graduating from high school in their state and publish their, their own scores, those tests would go away in a hurry. So I, the second point, I'll make this quickly on scale. I've, I've seen schools, districts change quite quickly. I've sort of adopted three states, Virginia, North Dakota, and Hawaii, where People at the top trust teachers to create more distinctive learning experiences and evaluate students on the basis of what they produce and create. And it doesn't, you know, if you give people leeway and support to do what they passionately want to do, what they entered the profession to do, and let students take on things they think are actually important, amazing progress happens. And yet we lose so much progress and momentum and, and actually impair kids for life because we've somehow decided we know what they have to learn instead of care about whether they are learning. Because the, the 6C framework that, that Kathy and Helen write about so in such a compelling way, there are so many ways to develop those skills. And if we just said we care about the ultimate skill set and, and not about whether you know, they've, they've checked this box or this box or this, this box off along the way, you know, that's how we're going to empower these kids. You know, you actually addressed the question from the audience member with that comment because he was asking, you know, what does it look like when you empower teachers to, to do what they, they know best to do, you know? Yeah. So thank you for that. I'm not putting in a plug because everything I do is free, but if they go to my website, whatschoolcouldbe.org, that's got a link to the film most likely to succeed that shows it, but it also has a documentary produced by a team in Hawaii about the work they're doing that we have this resource called in, appropriate for this form, Innovation Playlist with an emphasis on making it more joyful. And a group in Hawaii did a documentary on once you trust teachers to run with it, what happens with student engagement, student mastery of real skills, and what happens with teacher morale and a sense that teachers can collaborate and work as teams on things. It's night and day. And, and I just say, I find video particularly effective for capturing and communicating what can be done. But check it out because when you see it in front of you, it's very hard to go back and say, oh, no, no, we should do what we did before because that's where we're going to be in big trouble as a country as, as come September if we just say, oh, thank goodness, time to get back to normal, you know, because that, that's not where we want to head out of. Kathy, you, you've seen a lot of um, this in, in small and in schools and in classrooms. Can you tell us a little bit of what you've observed and, you know, this? confusion between play and rigidity or structure can you can you have structure without you know rigidity right you, i mean playful learning is is very structured and very well thought out um, go to any montessori classroom go to a children's museum you'll see there are clear learning goals here and and the way we think about it it's as i said active engaged meaningful etc but what does it look like what does it look like so i want to take you on a little trip and, um, and then Ted, you get to take a trip too, because you'll have to give your examples because you have so many more. So again, it was a thing like, uh, Victoria, you've seen it, you know, the people saying, oh my gosh, I don't know if this will work. And then I went back to Westchester, Pennsylvania, and I walked in the classroom one day because they invited me. They were so excited. I had to see this. So one of the schools was doing weather. And I walked into this classroom and there was like a low level chatter throughout the classroom. One little girl 
was standing in front of a map of the United States. Another little boy had boxes pointed to this child who was in front of the map. And another girl seemed to be copiously taking notes. I said, wow, what's going on here? And he goes, shh, you're about to hear the weather report. The girl in front of the map says, oh my, we have a low pressure system that's coming from west to east across the United States. Apparently we're going to have precipitation in three days. Now I'm listening to this. These kids are five. What do they know from low pressure systems? What do they know from precipitation? Now that's a high level vocabulary term. Okay, so I walk over to the next table. Again, these kids are deeply involved in what they're doing. What are they doing? The teacher has given them some um, circles of different circumference and little droppers. And as groups of four, they were to figure out how many drops of water fit into the circumference of the circle that was one inch, two inch, or three inch. And when they were done, they were graphing it. That kind of sounds like STEM to me. In the other school that I visited, they were doing fairy tales where the children asked me to sit down and be the audience, which of course I did quickly. And they told me that they were going to do something that seemed to be some crazy story that I couldn't quite put together about bears and a little girl who had a red cape on. And I said, what are you doing? They said, oh, we're inventing our own story. Have you ever heard of a mashup? All right, what happened in the standard scores in the Westchester school? Well, they went up. For all the classrooms that had experienced this relative last year, the standard scores went up. They had less retention in their classrooms, so everybody was graduating more and the writing skills were better. And yes, Ted, they could use what they had learned in new circumstances. So I want to ask a question that came from the audience, but I think is very timely because we are in a situation where many, perhaps most schools around the country and the world are still uh, closed and doing remote learning. Are there any practices that you've seen that are working in the remote learning environment that are worth keeping post COVID when we can reopen schools? Maybe I'll go to Ted. Well, you know, I've, I've circled back to a lot of the people I've written about or have done films about, you know, where students have voice and the skills to manage and direct their learning, where the learning's authentic, where they're doing something they believe is important. And does everybody feel some degree of stress and anxiety over the last eight months? Absolutely. I mean, this has not been an easy period for anyone, but consistently they say in those circumstances, kids continue to learn quite you know, effectively. And so I, I feel like it's the same thing. We know what to do, right? But, but when you say it's more the instruction driven, cover the curriculum model, and you try to, it, it, I think Kathy said it in the, in the intro or Helen, that it, it, we, it didn't work well in person it's a disaster on Zoom. And, and so I think that coming out of this, and it, it really sort of pervades my thinking because I think we had this enormous opportunity going forward to build on what's worked, to have it be accentuated. I think parents are more in the know. I mean, boy, parents do it. If parents were grateful to teachers before, I think they're triply, you know, inf you know exponentially grateful to teachers now. But I also think parents seeing what their kid's doing at home start to say, hmm, well, I never use that as an adult. Like, well, why are you doing that? I mean, that may, may not make much sense. And so where I found the things that are really working or you give, you know, it's not so much, I mean, because it's a very exhausting time for teachers. And so I'm really deeply grateful for their dedication and commitment in, in a, an extremely challenging time. But I think the teachers that are making the most of this are the ones that are restoring some degree of fulfillment and joy in the profession as they challenge students to take on things students care about. So they're getting lots and lots of great student learning without having to be doing Zoom calls until you know, 10 p.m. or something like that. And so I think we've got you know, plenty of plenty, of there's never been a shortage of great examples of learning experiences in the United States. And that's why so many other countries come here to understand the best of what we do. And then they leave and say, well, why aren't they doing that broadly? I think that's a fair question. So I think that's our opportunity to, to really make sure that the narrative going forward is we can do this. We know how to have kids learn joyfully. We know how to restore the, the, the important values teachers enter the profession to do. We have great 
appreciation for what they're doing. And I think, you know, by the way, I mean, if anybody on this call has M Miguel Cordona's year, beg him not to do another round of standardized tests in the spring. That's my, if I had one thing to beg for, I'd say, ask schools, districts, and states to use these next four, five, six months to pilot alternative assessments because those tests never told us much in the first place. In this spring, they will tell us nothing. Hmm. Let me turn to Victoria now on, you know, what can we do system-wide? So um, because we've got the PDG grant and, you know, we're using that funding with our coaches, we actually have our cadre of kindergarten coaches who are using Zoom calls to still coach teachers in play and how to get the lessons to the children, but have them take them off of the computer and use play in their classroom. I'll also say that this is a great opportunity for parents to become more involved in their children's education. Play isn't just up to, you know, teachers aren't the only people that can educate your child through play. And a lot of parents probably do it without even realizing it, but it's a great opportunity with all this family time to let your children take you on exploration and let them teach you what they know about things, but lead them down play. And um, there are organizations and there are websites that can train parents in teaching through play as well. And, and that is actually a really, um, good point about, you know, can, what can parents do? And let me turn to Kathy, because actually one of our audience members, Inez, asked, you know, what can parents do at home to support the development of the six feet? Well, I think the most important thing we can do as parents at home is be aware. Um, it, this is a change of mindset. If we went into this year thinking that the only thing that was important was making sure that the kids reading and math scores went up on a standardized test, then we're not gonna get there. And frankly, it's really hard to be a parent or I speak as a grandparent as well in trying to do that. Um, it, it's much easier to say, let's have some fun with books. And when you read those books and you have fun with them and you act them out and you play charades and the kids really understand what they're reading and you have discussions with their children so that their communication skills are now strong enough to be able to feed into what they're gonna do in reading. And let me add that being bilingual or trilingual is a good thing. So having your home language as a base is a very good thing. And there are many activities that we can play with. By the way, cooking. We've had to make a lot more meals these days. Let's take the theme of cooking. How many eggs do you need? How much oil do the cookies need? And if you just use that as a math lesson, they're learning sophisticated stuff. I mean, my little five-year-old told me the other day she was learning fractions from what we were doing by talking about cooking examples. So I just wanna say that this is an opportunity for all of us to help teach in the way human brains learn. And I think a lot of teachers have already been there, but they get handcuffed. And if we use other methods like observations and we allow ourselves to have the freedom to, as I say, be culturally variant and more inclusive, I think there's no limit to what we can do in our schools. Well, we have a couple minutes left and I wanna to turn to Elizabeth um, just to uh, very short um, say, you know, we, we wanna transform education, how can, the business side help in that process? You know, what kinds of partnerships could, could be established? Well, my own sense is business wants this as much as anyone. Uh, in February, I was at a um, leadership conference at West Point and to break the ice, they were going around the table saying, what keeps you up at night? The third person of about 30 said, the education system. And then the next 27 also said the same thing. That's what keeps them up at night. They care about where they're going. Um, I think going to those organizations and asking to work with them on these, on these issues is, is exactly the right way to move it forward. And similarly, and just Victoria, uh, short, what, what can we as citizens do to get policymakers and decision makers to pay attention to this? and to really 
do the kind of work you did when you were a representative. You should look to New Hampshire because New Hampshire is leading in this, um, but you really need buy-in. Our commissioner of education, our deputy commissioner of education have been all in on this. Like I said, UNH has partnered with us and we it's really about getting out and educating all of the stakeholders about how important this is and really what the payoff is down the road. I mean, this is really important work that we're doing. You say play and people all of a sudden start to think, well, you know, they're not, they're not learning anything. And that's really our task is to educate people in knowing that that is the best way that children learn and they will get the most out of being taught that way. I just wanna, sorry, I wanna add one more thing here. It's not just getting hired. It is your career path for life. And organizations need to in, be investing in that too. So many people started a job and never go up and this is really about lifelong learning. It's about taking those six C's and embracing them forever. So it really is a con an effort in concert. Well, thank you all so much. We've reached our one hour mark and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time and commitment to, to join us today for the beginning of a conversation. I think this is a very important conversation that we started here. Thank you to Kathy um, and her co-authors for the wonderful report. And of course, to our you know, wonderful uh, panelists, Ted, Victoria, Elizabeth, for joining us today at Brookings for this conversation and all our audience members. We hope you continue engaged through our um, you know, uh, Twitter chat that we're gonna have and uh, answer your questions with the rest of the co-authors. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.